Hello, everyone, and welcome to Using Comics in the Classroom. Today, we're going to talk about practical tools um, for developing curriculum. And um, I want to tell, uh, start with by talking a little bit about what CBLDF does. Um, our webinar series is intended to provide um, tools and strategies for you to help you include comics into your curriculum or into uh, library programs. Um, CBLDF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting the First Amendment rights um, of everyone involved in the comic art form. So that includes creators and educators and librarians and readers and retailers. Uh, we're here to provide advice and representation legal referrals, assistance, and education um, to furtherance the goals of um, keeping uh, First Amendment rights um, at the forefront. Uh, we're a small organization. We are supported directly by contributions of our members. If you are not a member, please, um, please look at our website. There are lots of um, fun goodies that you can get um, by joining. Um, without any further ado, I want to let our panelists introduce ourselves, and uh, I guess we will start with whoever wants to start. <laughs> Yeah. I'll, I'll go. I'll jump in then. Okay. Fine. Um, awesome. I'm Eric, Eric Allenborn. I am the current department chair of art and music at Oaklawn Community High School on the south side of Chicago. I've taught English for 13 years. I'm still teaching English, but I'm working on my art endorsement. I have create. I created a graphic novel curriculum uh, with the help of Mr. Whitaker over at our old high school district, and I am working on creating a English art co graphic novel course at the new high school I'm working on where it will how it will work as a non-publishing house out of the high school and our goal will be to create a thematic comic book every year like you would a yearbook uh, but it would be a comic book and that's kind of who I am in a nutshell I've presented at uh, most of the major comic cons and educational cons across the country about the fabulousness of comics in the classroom and happy to be here glad you're here I'm Ronnell Whitaker. Uh, I am uh, the Mr. Whitaker that Eric just referenced there. So I am the department chair over at Community High School District 218. Um, wow, like right now we are piloting and using a ton of different electives. One of our uh, flagship electives is graphic novels, um, but we're also adopting more and more uh, different classes that are gonna be uh, like going towards different literacies. Right now, we are piloting a music as literature course next year. Um, so that, that's kind of one of our plans. But I've been teaching for 13 years. Awesome. Glad you're here. <laughs> I'm Tracy Edmonds, and I was an elementary classroom teacher and a reading intervention specialist for 12 years. And now I work as a freelance curriculum developer and a writer. My uh, areas of expertise are elementary science and using comics and graphic novels in education. Um, I create things to help teachers use comics the best that they can in their classroom because I know the power of the medium. Um, right now I'm working with Andrews McNeil and DC Comics and a few other publishers and yeah. I love comics and I love teachers to use them. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and I, I'm Matt Brady. Um, I've been teaching science now for, this is my 11th year. I teach chemistry and physics. Um, and prior to getting into education, I ran newsarama.com, co-founded ran newsarama.com for, for too long. Um, along with my wife, who is also a science teacher, uh, we Madison. Which is to bring pop culture, comics, movies, video games room to show. Am I slowing down here? Well, you paused so okay. that, yeah, like you froze and then the audio uh, did a gotcha. lot to, get, yep. to catch up. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, my wife and I both uh, use a lot of pop culture in our classes to get our students interested in science. Um, that, that gives them the hook. We also work with Wake Forest University here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, as part of the Science of Winston-Salem, where we do kind of the same thing. Um, I, I've written a bunch of articles. I have a bunch of articles due on science and pop culture now. So uh, yeah, that's, that's me in the nutshell. And don't you have a book? This? <laughs> yes, I have The Science of Rick and Morty. There we are. So it's, it's, 
even. It comes out um, October 1st in bookstores and Amazon everywhere. Yay. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. You're all beautiful people. I appreciate your time and your expertise. Really excited um, to get started. So I guess we will get started. Uh, let's talk a bit um, about just the general um, educational benefits of comics. And, and what, what have you found um, with using comics? Like what, uh, what educational benefits have you found personally? I'll jump in first because I think the science guy might be the last person you'd expect to, to say anything. Um, we may not do as much from the literacy standpoint um, in terms of science and comics. Although, wait, there are plenty of comics that are about scientists and about science um, out there, uh, where I find it really helps is to use examples from comics, little science examples, almost throwaways um, that the, the writers will put in and use the story to hook my students into caring about that example. For, um, for instance, one of the recent issues of Fantastic Four, Dr. Doom trapped the human torch uh, in a uh, substance that he could breathe, a breathable liquid. Breathable liquids, those things are real. Let's talk about the science of them. Wow. And then uh, Johnny Storm absorbed the heat from the liquid to expand the volume and break the chamber. Okay, that wouldn't work, why not? Well, and then we start talking about how water is different than anything else. So the story, the, the interestingness of the characters can hook my students in ways that just a worksheet or a PowerPoint or something from a book just can't quite do it. Um, so that's, that's really the, the, one of the main benefits that I see. You hook the, hook the, the students with the, the power of comics, that story, that character, that color, the things that they know and love. I'll, I'll jump into that and also say, I think there's still this sort of newness and uniqueness about comics in the classroom that hasn't worn out yet and hopefully will never will. But I mean, I mean, we've been using comics. Most of us on this webinar here have been teaching or using comics for at least the past 10 years. And it doesn't seem like a lot of people, I mean, the numbers are growing every year, but a lot of people still haven't found the usefulness of comics yet because they've, maybe they're new to the medium and they're kind of afraid to try that out. So what these students are experiencing whenever they have a teacher who brings comics into the classroom, it's generally new. And it still has this sort of like, hey, this is something interesting that I know a lot of teachers haven't tried yet. And then students... A lot of them in my classroom have never read a comic or graphic novel before I give them one. And then we create new comic and graphic novel readers. I mean, we're only a couple of weeks into the school year here and I've already had a girl read maybe five graphic novels from my shelf just, just for enrichment, not even for class because she's like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Give me more. And I know, you know, a lot of the educators here and, and the, the attendees are finding the same thing. So I think it's kind of cool that, if you are an educator looking to get into the medium, you're kind of still ahead of the curve here, even though this curve has been growing for a little while, that you can find these new ways to engage students while it's still fresh. I would say too, um, there's a bunch of reasons, right? I mean, for one, it's comics are great for addressing almost all the standards that you need to address. We're talking about Comic Core, reading for information, reading for literature. Um, every single one of those things, comics can act as a great gateway into those and entry into those. Um, I know very often we talk about comics as a way to hook in reluctant readers, and they are good for that, but they're also good for giving those kids who aren't reluctant readers uh, different entry points into uh, reading for information, into exploring multiple literacy. But beyond like the buzzword speak that we're used to using in education, what I found, the reason that I love using comics so much is the equity it builds with me, between me and my students. And I don't mean like, uh, like, you know, it equalizes the playing field, which it does. I mean the investment, right? Like, so if I give a kid, uh, you know, Ultimate Spider-Man, the first week of school, and we're using that as our actual anchor text in the beginning of the year, then it's much easier for them, for me to get them to transition over to August Wilson's Fences. Because now they trust our classroom, they trust my choices, and they trust that no matter what I put in front of them, it's for 
they're good and chances are they'll probably enjoy it. So I would guess like those are probably the biggest reasons why I think we should all be adopting music comics in the classroom. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback on that, talking about, you know, the engagement that, that graphic novels and comics um, can can bring to students that, that maybe a, a regular text might not right off the bat. I'm going to share, um, I don't know if you guys can see that. Oh, and I'll put it in there. Here, hold on. I'll do it this way. There it is. So this is more of a, you know, I do technical things with comics. So this, this is just why comics are good for kids. Why comics are good for learning. So they're engaging. That's what you guys are talking about. You know, they, kids love them. That's the, the number one thing. If they're not going to pay attention to something, it doesn't matter. So they, they tend to pay attention to comics. It also requires them to use both sides of their brain. They have to use the visual and the, um, the text, and they have to put those two together. They're efficient. If you're trying to teach somebody something, comics can get across the information uh, in a shorter period of time and with more detail. Um, and then I have a bunch of uh, research that says read, processing text and images together, they will recall and they will transfer their learning um, in a better way. Not only that, they'll have a better attitude. Um, so this is sort of a, um, that's on my site, you guys can download that for free. That just sort of gives all the reasons if you need ammunition to take to parents or administrators, this is a kind of in a nutshell piece that you can Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And also we put that link in the chat so you can, everyone can pull that up too and look at that um, whenever you're ready. Um, so let's talk a little, so, so uh, again, um, in some ways, I know for me, uh, graphic novels were very useful. Uh, educational benefits um, were for for different types of learners. Um, I had students on the spectrum. Um, I taught in higher ed. I didn't introduce myself enough. I, I, I taught in higher ed for 15 years. Um, and taught writing courses and literature courses and graphic novels were great for um, helping different types of learners like was already said could we talk a little bit more about that um, about how um, how these help specific learner learning groups yeah I would say comics represent access end of the day that, that's, that's what they represent they represent access to ideas that a lot of different communities have felt that they don't have the opportunity to engage in. Um, when I taught using uh, Romeo and Juliet by Eric, help me out, please. Gareth Hines. Thank you, Gareth Hines. I, I feel so bad because we, we, he's a friend of ours. <laughs> but uh, it was one of the times where I had kids who were silent most of the time in my course, um, finally thinking that they could actually talk about a text that has been held up, you know, as this. Uh, example of you know great canonical literature and these are kids who primarily have been told that they they aren't allowed to read those kinds of books um, I, I taught in a, a community that was primarily um, uh, uh, so Mexican and, and, and Central American immigrants as well as um, some of our quote-unquote at risk and I'm not a fan of that term but it, I mean it's what we use when we have uh, students and it was the one time where I had kids who felt that they could not only um, access literature, but they could uh, examine it the way that they've seen others do before. So I think that's probably, like, that was probably the biggest eye-opener for me. Because every kid I put that, those books in front of, would view it as an equal playing field. It's like comics aren't as intimidating as, you know, a crazy big, thick book. Mm -hmm. I'll... I'll piggyback on that too if, if that's okay and talk about the idea of like a lot of these texts for example american born chinese that book has so many different levels to it like you can read it if you're a struggling reader you can read that book and, and grasp most of the story but if you are like even up to like an ap senior level in high school you could read that book and get something completely different out of it because a lot of the themes and elements in that book are there, there's a lot of symbolism in that book. There's a lot of thematic elements that may gloss over some readers, but there's so much going on that unlike maybe a traditional classic prose text, you can take out of it what you want to get out of it. And I think even like that, even something as, as you know, kind of uh, quote unquote, like mainstream is uh, Miles Morales, Spider-Man. I mean, even, even if you look at the first trade of that, I mean, on the surface level, you can be, 
any reader and kind of get the story and, and fall in love with the character and what's happening. But there's also a lot of social commentary. There's a lot of things in there that we can have these discussions about as adults. So you're looking at a book that can be read and discussed from fifth grade, fourth grade, all the way up till, you know, uh, this guy's the limit there. And I think that that's amazing. There are, I'm going to address one of the questions in the chat here too, the idea of like English language learners. There are amazing graphic novels out there. First of all, that have no words talking about like the arrival. The arrival is a really good one. A book like here, a lot of these graphic novels that are being created that we don't even need to have the language barrier in order to read those. And I know a lot of our, when I was at my last district, some of the foreign language teachers were using comics in foreign languages to help teach that language because the images worked to supplement the words. And it wasn't just like they were translating text. They had the images to kind of help them figure out the context of what the language was. So I know there's a kind of a trend too for foreign language teachers to use comics. And, and most of the major publishers are, are being, uh, they're printing in, in multiple languages. So if you look hard enough, you can find, you don't even have to look that hard. I mean, our, our library at my new school has, we have a, a, a high Muslim population and there's a lot of books that we have written in Arabic, uh, Spanish. I mean, they're, abundant now you just have to know how to to find those but i think that the ability to put those graphic novels and comics into other languages has also helped a lot of students kind of bridge the language gap yeah i would say for the same reasons uh, coming from the elementary side of it anytime you're working with students who are um, at the beginning levels of reading whether they're young or they're just not there yet um, Graphic novels allow them to practice all of the things that you want to practice, you know, character and thought and all those other things in text analysis at a level where they can understand a much more complex story than they could with a book that is leveled at their level, right? You know, um, go see Spot, don't go so far. Um, but there are a lot of graphic novels that you could use with, with kids like that that allow them to access a story that's more at, at their level emotionally, um, developmentally, that kind of thing, and, and be able to access that story and do that work even without the text reading level to get there. Right. And just to echo where in science, I may not be at some of the same, aiming for some of the same targets that y'all are. Um, I think going back, I think, Ronell, you had kind of mentioned this or we're going there, this question or earlier about that relationship, that that equality of the teacher's not just this automaton that's delivering a lecture. The teacher actually likes stuff. The teacher, the teacher gave me a comic book to read um, and kind of inspired by you and Eric and some other teachers who've been out there posting, you know, here's a picture of all the comics that are in my classroom. I've started doing that and I don't have a comic book club yet in my new school, but they're there and I make it very clear to my students that they are there and they're for their enjoyment, whether it's after a test while we're waiting for everybody else to finish up or, or if they want to borrow them and take them home. That connection between me and them, allowing them to see me as a human being rather than just a teacher, as well as just their reading, they're reading something rather than the texts on their phones, which I've had that argument of I'm reading with my phone. Right. <laughs> I, I was, oh, go. I'm, I'm going to one last thing to, to kind of to Matt's point too, this idea and to synthesize a few of these ideas. I had a student who uh, we were one-to-one -one with iPads at our school and I have this freshman student who in his free time likes to watch YouTube videos of comics. So there's a lot of voice actors who yeah. will, who will read comics and they post them to YouTube and they, and they do all the voices and they read the text. And the student has kind of like fallen in love with comics through watching them on YouTube. And when he's in class, like reading a comic on YouTube, or it's kind of like the audio book of a comic, which is really interesting. And he'll come to me and he'll be like, yeah, I just read, I just watched this YouTube video. Do you have anything like this? And I was like, absolutely, come here. And then I'd take him and give him another book. But I'm like, I'd never seen that before. Cause I was like, hey, what are you doing on your iPad? He's like, I'm reading a comic. I'm like, let me see. And he showed me, I was like, this is pretty amazing. <laughs> it, was, it was a pretty cool thing to see. It's really cool. 
I would like to uh, speak to, because um, we haven't talked about this, but um, individuals on the spectrum, like comics are such a valuable tool for those. I have a friend who home taught um, or homeschooled her children because they were, they are on the spectrum and she utilized comics a great deal to teach them not so much hard skills, but, but the soft social skills. She could say, here's this comic and look at this until you get used to this, this social situation. And it helped her, um, it helped both of her children um, be able to, uh, yeah, to build, to build some of the social skills that they needed to do. Yeah, it's valuable for, for those learners as well. Let's see where we are in our outline here, guys. <laughs> We're having fun, so. <laughs> Um, so we've talked a little bit about uh, why we might want to use them because they are they are edu they have so many educational benefits from uh, we've talked about introducing multiple literacies um, we can also sequencing um, motivating reluctant readers um, they help with memory skills with reading comprehension vocabulary so on and so forth they're also a great scaffolding tool so I think maybe we could talk a little bit about that um, about not just why we would want to use them but how we can use them. Um, so could y'all like maybe speak to, um, to how you have used uh, comics to, um, for instructional scaffolding? Well, I mean, for me, I, I always uh, use comics to introduce students to uh, making inferences. Um, it's a skill that a lot of our students struggle with and once they are confronted with how to do it via comics, uh, it's almost like this light bulb goes off. So like uh, Scott McCloud's book, uh, a terrible title, so you won't ever get titles from me, people. Uh, Scott McCloud's book, is it Understanding Comics? Understanding <laughs> Comics, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the first one is called Understanding Comics, and there's like this really big portion on like the gutters, right? Like the stuff that happens in between. And on his website, he actually really, uh, uh, explores that. So in, in between the gutters is where like the action happens, right? So when you use that as kind of like the basis for how to like define inferencing for kids, when they say, okay, they show a guy with an axe in panel one, and then in panel two, they show a person dead on the floor with an axe in their chest. I say the inferencing is the part in the middle, like how you fill in the blanks is what inferencing is. And once my kids got that, it was like, oh, so it's like I have to use the information that I'm seeing and make some assumptions about like how that care is for. And it was like, yes. And from there, my kids were easy. It was much easier for them to conceptualize that idea of how to make inferences. So that, I think that was probably the, the most concrete one I've, I've, I've done. Um, I've also taught uh, a lot of like symbolism through comics because, I mean, again, visually, it's very easy. Gareth Hines is. Uh, Romeo and Juliet and Miss Beowulf are great for that. There's like little Easter eggy things he hides in the images that kids are way better at finding than than I am even. And I think that was probably uh, one of my other big clues that I could really use to tackle really anything I want to use with traditional literature I use with uh, comics. When I was teaching my, my comics class last year, the one of the first things we did was we read everyone's an alien when you're an alien by johnny sun and that kind of introduced this idea of how simple yet amazingly complex and beautiful comics can be and from that that was the first thing we read i would have the students create like a, just a 11 by 17 just like a one panel comic like what do you want to say what's important in your life and how can you say that in one image and that was the first thing we talked about to just introduce this idea of how comics can be useful and powerful. And then from there, we would do like a three panel series. And then we would do a one page, five to six panel idea. And then until the end where the end of the semester, they were then creating like three to four page comic concepts for an idea or a story that they wanted to create themselves. Now, I'm also notorious for saying that my English class wasn't an art class. Like there was no drawing in there. If a student was really good at, at, at making art, they could draw their comics but it was an English class, right? So we were writing and we were creating scripts and we were um, envisioning what we wanted to look like. And we were doing technical writing for hopefully to be put in front of an artist. So the students knew right off the bat that they didn't have to be afraid of if they thought they were, you know, they couldn't draw because we weren't drawing. This was a writing class. And 
And I thought that was really helpful and really kind of real world experience. And starting with that, everyone's an alien book and kind of building up from a one panel to a four page concept, really, it, it helped. Because if I did jump right into the four page thing with a lot of these kids never having read a comic or a graphic novel, they would have been just completely lost. But starting with that book really helped. I want to um, put forward a resource. I know, Ronell, you mentioned understanding comics, which a lot of people go to. It's the go-to book for, for understanding how comics work. Um, and then Eric touched on the idea that um, maybe somebody, I have a lot, you have, you'll have kids all the time say, I don't know how to draw. Um, there's a series of books called Adventures in Cartooning from First Second Books. And I would say for elementary, that's the understanding comics. There's a lot in there that will help um, uh, them understand how comics go together, how you can make them, how you can read them. And also it really brings down the intimidation level on drawing. It breaks things down into small pieces and shapes and helps kids figure out it's about the meaning. It's not about, you know, how detailed your work is. And one of the things I always say to everyone, um, if someone says, you know, I can't draw, one of the most popular web comics in the world is XKCD and it is just stick figures. So, you know, if you're going to be making comics, I would definitely say um, use adventures in cartooning, you know, with elementary kids. And even I would say that the first book is, is definitely applicable to older kids as well. It's, it's cute, <laughs> but it does get a lot of uh, good concepts across. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I, in terms of, of, of scaffolding and reaching students, uh, chemistry can be, or physics can be rather dull and dry and boring. Um, something that I've started using in class and I recommend that my students pick up, or I have been for a while, are Larry Gonick's books, Cartoon Guides to, there, whoa, there we are. <laughs> cartoon Guide to Chemistry, Cartoon Guide to Physics. Because um, my students, whenever I mention it, always kind of just like, really? And then they get into it and they start to realize oh, this is the same stuff we're talking about, but instead of ha having Mr. Brady explain what an electron is, it's this fuzzy monster over here that just sticks to everything that's positive. And turning it into, again, turning it into story, turning it into characters helps them to better internalize it. Um, and I've also started, you mentioned, uh, Tracy mentioned XKCD. That's basically my artistic style in a nutshell. Um, and I've had my students start to do annotated formulas where if we have a large formula dimensional analysis or something like that that has many steps draw it almost as a comic or at least kind of more in the in the scott mcleod just down through the page of step one and have a character have a stick figure explaining what to do step two have the figure explaining what to do if for nothing else just you have it in your notes and your notes are explaining it to you but break it down in that comic style format of Step one, step two, step three, panel one, panel two, panel three. It's baby steps towards it, but it, it helps them figure things out. I, I also want to kind of add to, um, I know like there are, at least when I was a kid, that uh, comics kind of had a, a bad rap uh, for addressing uh, social issues. Um, and, and there's still some work to be done uh, now, but I, I will say that at least um, if you choose correctly the way I choose, to read, there's a lot of ways uh, that comics give access to some complex issues. Um, Lumberjanes is probably one of the funnest books I've read in a long, long time that I think allows uh, students to kind of not only see themselves as they are someone who is a part of the queer community, but also someone who can kind of ac access to those windows into uh, you know, those different kinds of identities as well. And in a way, it kind of opens up the door to have conversations if, if you need to. Um, I taught Using March, which is an amazing, amazing book by John Lewis and uh, Andrew Iden and, and um, Nate Powell. Um, but my entryway into that book was actually uh, B.B. Wolf and the Three LPs, uh, which is a graphic novel kind of pastiche about like kind of taking the Three Little Wolf, Three Little uh, Pigs story, but turning it on its head and basing it in um, depression era South. And the protagonist is actually the wolf and he's a sharecropper and a, a blues player. And the pigs are, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, they are the majority did it. They, so they kind of symbolize, uh, you know, whites who were oppressive in the South. And kids were able to access some of those ideas through those characters a lot easier 
uh, than when I started with uh, March Cole the year before. It was like giving them a chance to kind of, again, easily access the idea or the concept that you're gonna be grappling with, um, and then segue into something that might have been a bit heavier. So I think that's one of the things that Congress, I think, does massively well. It, it again, levels the playing field for folks to have a voice a lot easier sometimes. That's yeah. really- There are a lot of, there are a lot of titles that, that I think do that, that access social justice, that ac access issues of diversity. I mean, I know um, the book El Depo, written by Cece Bell, who is deaf, that um, I've seen t teachers talk about that book making their kids more empathetic um, and kinder just by reading the story and because they can all access it. And I think comics, um, because of facial expressions and body language, also can elicit an emotional response in readers that maybe text might not. And I think uh, even what you're saying with the Three Little Pigs uh, or story, Mouse does that with um, with World War II and, and and genocide as well. But in taking animals, somehow it, it it's like a spoonful of sugar. You can talk about things that atrocities that have happened to uh, to humans, and when we give them in animal form, uh, it's easier to digest um, for a lot of readers. And um, comics do that well. And I, before I belabor this point, I don't want to let us get past it. I feel like like um, we talked about it a little bit, but I think the science of does a really cool job of taking things like uh, you know pop culture uh, elements and introducing that into education. Uh, I, I think when people hear us talk about like using comics in the classroom, they feel like we're just going to have kids reading all the time. Uh, but I think that um, you know Matt and you know uh, people like our uh, colleagues in our district, they do a really good job of saying. We don't have to read the whole comic. I mean, you could really just use the human torch as a physics problem. Mm -hmm. And just taking that little small part of it, I think, um, <laughs> I, I love that math and the share it too. Just taking that <laughs> small part of it is, I, I think, is, is invaluable too. Like, you can use comics outside of uh, the classroom or outside of even just uh, reading the entire comic. Uh, one of our colleagues uses uh, the Constitution graphic novel. Um, it doesn't read the whole thing sometimes. It just goes to like specific amendments that he wants kids to tackle. But I, I had to give you a plug, man, because I don't think you did a good enough job. But, <laughs> Always appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and well, yeah, I mean, the, the, I think probably my most effective way of what Ronell is talking about there, let me just send that out. Um, but the most, the most effective way of, of using just a bit of comics um, is in physics, I would always use, or I always do, um, uh, Gwen Stacy's fall off the George Washington Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, depending on what corrected version you look at, in Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man. And e even though the comic is probably about as old as their parents now, um, it came out 73, I think, um, it's still, the, the writing and the art is, still speaks to the kids and it pulls them in. And so if you embrace that story aspect, and again, even in science, you embrace that story aspect of, of getting this idea across. And I, I have it paced out on slides that I kind of narrate it as I go and say, but then, and it's a picture of Gwen Stacy upside down and you see the word snap by her neck. And I would do that. And I, I know I'm on my game when my students, you know, I'll hear from my students, just somebody in the back of the room will be like, oh, <laughs> and and it's like yeah I hit it and and they and they've they've used that in the movies in the second Andrew Garfield movie um, but it's most effective in the comics and then they want to figure out okay okay what about impulse and momentum that can tell me what did she experience why did she die in I want to know why she died <laughs> no <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, we may never know. It's a cliffhanger. Wait, 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 wait. Yay. There we go. There. Woo. Okay. She died. <laughs> Spoiler. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like what, what Renell's saying about you don't have to read the whole book. There are plenty of, um, you can pull pieces all the time. In fact, one of the things I've seen done, which is great, is there's a, um, a series called Science Comics from first second, and there are books on everything from dinosaurs to rockets. There you go. Um, and say, you know, kids are studying uh, biology. There's a book on cats, a book on dogs. 
you can just pull short sections of the book and assign them and have the kids read them and then bring that knowledge in and share it and sort of use it as a jigsaw just like you would with an article or something like that. To, kind of, to do a little avant-garde experience <clears throat> with the kids too, especially if you're teaching older ones, you can always have them like pull out their phone and look at either their, their camera feed, like their, the last pictures they've taken or the last like 10 Instagram posts they've made and say, imagine this was the comic book of your last two weeks. Like, what does that say about your life? What does that say about who you are? And then kind of use that as a think piece. And I really kind of got some, some uh, like blowback from the kids who just like take all selfies. It's like, okay, so your, your comic or your graphic novel is pretty self-indulgent, right? Why do you think that is? And it just opens up these like real honest conversations with some of the kids too. Or some of the kids would be like, well, I really like my dog. So I guess my graphic novel or my comics about my pets because that's all the photos I've taken. And those, because that's all they are basically, right? I mean, panels in a comic book are, are photos. They're just very well-timed photos. And um, it, it's kind of interesting to have the kids look at their pictures and analyze how those become comics. And you're also making them think about their own identity, which I think we should always do from, from even early ages. <laughs> yeah. And their own story, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we've talked, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about, um, we've talked about how we can, can use comics um, to supplement um, other curriculums. Um, Y'all are so, so fantastic. <laughs> So thank you for all of that. Uh, I would like for us to talk a little bit about um, maybe just comics themselves and how we can use those to in, in, include comics-based uh, curriculum with just the study of comics. And I would like to start with Eric because Eric, you are developing um, a course just for this. And and um, I art art or art um, integration was a big thing for me uh, when I taught. I loved it um, because it doesn't just allow you to uh, to meet core standards, but you're teaching soft skills, you're teaching teamwork, especially collaborative things, you're teaching teamwork, you're teaching, um, you have to work through this problem together, things, you know, that, that kids, uh, a lot of times our studies seem to be really isolated, and when you include comics, it's collaboration, and it's automatically putting people together, so I think that's a really valuable thing, but could you talk a little bit about uh, the program you're developing? Sure, I don't think any artistic, I mean, any any artistic endeavor that works to complete a goal is, is individual. It's all, mostly it's always collaborative. And that's one of the main, the major amazing things about art in general and artistic careers is that you are collaborating with folks all the time. And I think teaching, teaching is a very artistic career. You know, we're using our creativity all the time. So we're always working with colleagues and going to meetings and figuring out the right way to do something. So when I got hired at my new job, one of the things that was like, intriguing was this idea to be able to create a comics class that wasn't just teaching comics, but kind of creating a comic that we would actually publish. And I loved that idea, but I also didn't want it to be just a straight, just drawing class. I didn't want it to be an art class. I wanted it to be, have like a, a lot of heavy writing components to it as well and collaborative components as well. I wanted to work with the community as much as possible. So one of the things I've done over the past 10 years of going to cons and working with artists is I've started making a lot of connections. So I have a lot of connections with local artists in the Chicagoland area and artists across the country. And they've done work for me in my classroom and my students paid work. You know, we raise the money, we pay them because you all, you know, it's, I, it's a shame when we ask artists to do anything for free. So I want to pay them what they're worth and the ability to kind of work with people across the country with my students to create something was really intriguing. So the idea of, I'm, I'm actually working on the course proposal right now. It's actually due October 1st. So I'll, I'm kind of in the middle of it right now and kind of the shape it's taking is in my head right now, it's either going to be, uh, it's going to be a junior and a senior elective uh, hopefully, this is all tentative, by the way, a junior and senior elective where the students have to have uh, two years of English and at least a year of art as some background. And then they could take this course both years if they wanted to, because the books I teach as like the base for teaching them comics and graphic novels are going to be on a two year cycle. So the books they get junior year would not be the same books they get senior year and vice versa. The goal being then it's either going to be an art and an English elective 
um, or possibly a, a, a blocked course where it's maybe one, two periods of the day and one period is English class and the other period is the art class where the students would like a yearbook, come up with a theme. Like what's the theme of the year? We want to do personal stories. Do we want to tell many funny stories? Do we want to do comic book esque hero stories? And then we would create about a 35 page comic worth of stories. So maybe that would be 10 three page stories or however that played out. And the students would work with their research and using probably understanding comics as our base text would then map out what those texts would look like. Now, if we had some, some really good artists in, in the school, we could use some of them to, to draw and create some of the art. And most of the art would probably be sourced out to professional artists. So then those students would figure out which artists they'd want to work, work with, contact those artists and see if those artists were willing to work on that with them and they would negotiate the price with them. And then with me on the emails, they would have this working relationship with the artist. I've seen it a little bit in the past couple of years with stuff where my students created those like 11 by 17 prints and then they would communicate with artists that I knew to kind of make their, uh, their art come to fruition. And it actually, they actually did. I've actually created like 10, 11 by 17 prints from professional artists that my students have written. Mm. And that process was amazing. And that was one of the things that also drove me to kind of want to do this on a bigger scale and create a non-publishing house out of the high school. And then what we would do is at the end of the year, once that book was finished and published, and the students would also do the research on where we should get this published and who should design the cover and all of those things, we would work with the business courses, create um, materials to promote it and then work the cons, the cons throughout the summer and the fall and the spring to sell the book to then create the money to make it for the next year. So it's just kind of like this cyclical project that happens where we can even get the business classes involved to help us with the marketing of it all, the art classes involved, the English classes involved, the administration, and the students are actually in the real world at cons selling their book um, to con goers. And we could also do educational cons as well as comic cons to sell this book because I'm sure teachers are going to want to buy books from students. And then um, we, we keep the cycle going. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I have some more like details, like specifics written down. But as far as like the larger scope, that's, that's where I'm imagining it right now. That's awesome. <laughs> There's a lot of moving pieces there, but I think I'm, I'm confident that, that we can get this going. Um, I would like to say what's fantastic about uh, like, and that's a beautiful thing. And, um, but what is great about, about comics, other collaborative arts, I do agree that all art is collaborative, but even as a writer, you do a lot of that work. You do a lot of alone work a lot mm -hmm. of times. Um, and other like theater is also a collaborative thing, but it's really expensive and it's, and it's, it's not just expensive in having to have costumes and things it's it's, it's it, you have to have a lot of space to store those things what's great about comics you don't need a lot of space you don't need a lot of space if you don't have a lot of space to uh, in your classroom if you don't have a you, you know you don't have to have a place to produce it and and stage it it's it's economical on so many levels um and it and and buying um even if you even if you buy really good art supplies it's still going to be cheap it's still going to be a, a cheaper and more um, accessible way to include art integration in your classroom than um, than trying to do um, theater or or other visual arts yeah. yeah and it's cheaper cheaper to take it across the country too right if i wanted to take a group of students to do a theater production in new york man we might have to rent trucks we might have to do right. all of these things but if i'm just taking a booth set up and you know five thousand copies of a comic and i know that's you know, high hopes, but you know, that it, it's way less stuff to, to worry about. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think I heard somebody asked in the, in the comments about um, creating comics with different groups. You're obviously dealing with um, a group of kids that has elected to take this. They're into it. They're ready to go. Um, in a regular classroom, you might have different levels of commitment and confidence in what they're doing. Really comics takes a pencil and a paper. That's really at its basic level all it takes. But there are a lot of other tools that you can use. I love the idea of having kids who like to write be the writers and kids who like to draw be the artists and have them collaborating. Um, another option for kids who are not confident in their drawing, at least at first, is to use a digital, uh, digital comics creation. Um, one of, there are two that I have heard that 
teachers like the best. One is called Pixton, P-I-X-T-O-N. The other one is called Make Beliefs. I'm going to put that in here. Okay. Um, oh, make sure you're hitting to all panelists and attendees from the drop down because it, I think it's just going to the panelists. All panelists. How about all and, and attendees, yeah. Um, okay, awesome. I've heard, you know, I've heard so many stories of, of teachers who start here where they're just pulling pictures and putting them together and creating. You still have to understand how comics work. You still have to understand what do you want to show in this panel? What do you want to show in this panel? What are you leaving out in between? Um, and they progress from there to then drawing later. This gives them the confidence to get there. So I think those, the, some of the digital creators are good tools for that. And photographs, I know it's still, but it still can do the same thing. And, and most kids have phones and they can actually just do, you know, um, or a lot of kids have phones, um, even just from their phones. And, um, and you're also, bring, you're still bringing in concepts of, of body placement and, and visual arguments um, that you would if you drew it. Yeah. And, and it I, makes it more excellent. To, to uh, piggyback on Tracy's point too, the, the class that I've taught the past couple of years, like those kids, a lot of those kids were just placed into my comics class from the counselors and they didn't choose to take that class. But how I got, how I worked to get those kids engaged was to let them create on anything that they felt was important to them. Right. So I, any of the kids that I felt were, were disengaged, I would have individual meetings with them and be like, all right, so what are you really into? What are you, what are you passionate about? And then we would create a comic based on that. And I generally, after I had that individual conversation with them about how I could tailor this class to their interests, I generally found a lot of that kind of hesitancy went away. Okay. Um, so before we get into questions, we have like maybe, maybe three more minutes. Uh, I thought we could, we, talk a little bit not just about how um, how comics help us uh, give students new information and help us in the educational realms um, but how they help us build relationships maybe or or and help us in some other uh, ways I know I in the past I use comics not just to um, to help give information but I would use them to help assess students I would give in my lit classes I would give students the option of either taking a pop quiz of writing a summary paragraph or of drawing a uh, four to six panel comic that just shows me, you know, I'm like, and, and, and it's just based on, you're just showing me that you understood what you read and one that you read it because that was of course my oh, plight as <laughs> get me so angry when my students didn't read what they were supposed to. Um, but yeah, like it was a way to, to just assess it and, and low level, like low, like uh, to help them know too, like this is not like, you know, lower the anxiety like we're learning here and this is fun and it doesn't have to be um you don't have to create so much anxiety and it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to to not know something i'm here to help you uh do that so it allowed me to assess one way not just if they had read but on students like i could still just from reading their comic panels like oh, okay you read this but you didn't understand what was going on here so we need to cover this in class um, uh, so are there other ways that comics have maybe helped you build, you know, uh, Mr. Whitaker, you talked a little bit about how it helped you build a rapport with students. Um, does anyone else have some, oh, or, or Mr. Whitaker, any, uh, have, uh, some, uh, input on, um, on how comics has, have helped you in other aspects of, of classroom management? I've always had comics um, like in a free reading basket. I, I did it when I was teaching. We were in a very, very scripted, um, pretty hardcore reading intervention program with a bunch of, I happened to have all boys in my group that year. Um, and their favorite thing to do when we were done and had extra time was just to grab all the comics and graphic novels and they would talk to each other about them. And I had a student who, he was in third grade. He literally could not read a word when he came in. The first book he read was a, a book from Toon Books, which is a very low text reading level. He read it himself and he just beamed. And then he wanted to read more and more and more. And I think um, that's the power. And that was the magic, you know, for that student. So I, I hear stories like that all the time. You don't hear people all the time say, I learned to read through comics. So that's, that's one really great um, connection. Uh, I would say that there's a, a, a a wealth of knowledge or literature out there now that's coming out about um, using comics and therapy and anger management. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things where uh, just kids having the ability 
to uh, you know, voice their stories and represent themselves is, is ultimately valuable. Um, mm-hmm. The one thing I've always sold to, whether it's parents or board members or whoever, the real reason why I love comics is because it's one of the last few mediums that still feels like it's living. So many of our kids have uh, come from schools where, uh, you know, what they've read have been a, a lot of dead old white guys. Mm-hmm. So their only idea about what quote unquote real literature is, is defined by the Hemingways of the world. And, and that's in high school. Um, I think when they first, when I first have them talk to an artist or a writer of a book that we read, um, or when I, I show them pictures of myself with other creators, uh, and they're like, oh, you know these people? And like, like now I'm famous. <laughs> so, like, so it's like, like oh, you, you, you talk to Gene Yang? That's crazy. It's like, yeah, you my buddy. You know, it's no big deal. Uh, but it's just cool. It's just cool to <laughs> show these kids that like, these are real people and anybody can make a comic. When we read web comics in our class, you know, I'm often, you know, quick to point out, like, you could do this today. Like, this person, you know, we, uh, y'all brought up XKCD. Or it was the X, whatever. Anyway, uh, <laughs> like, you brought that stuff up. Um, it's It kind of, again, it democratizes it, right? It's like, like, these kids are growing up in a world where media is much more uh, easy to create as well as it is to consume. So when you give them an idea that they can now create literature as well, and be taken seriously and possibly be someone that Mr. Whitaker invites to talk to their class via Skype. Uh, they like, they, they salivated that. It's, it's again, it's a, a, a gateway that they had normally thought was closed. Like most of my kids never thought they would write a play or write a book, but literally every one of them at some point writes a comic in my class. And, and they, they, they really dig into that. So I, I think, that was probably the one thing. It helped like to show my kids they could be creators in more ways than one. I think if you're gonna be a teacher of comics too, and, and I've said this in a couple of blog posts in the past, blog posts, you have to really, you have to just dive into the medium. You have to read a lot. You have to kind of, it helps, it helps. And I know a lot of us are, are you know, we're restricted by time and there's only so much time in a given day. But to be able to read as much as you possibly can, because when a kid comes up to me and they're like, can you give me something to read? The first thing I ask is, what types of TV shows and movies do you like? Uh, what, what, what's your favorite book? And then they tell me, and then I've read so many comics and graphic novels that I can give them something that's exactly like that. And then, then they come back and they're like, oh, what else you got for me? As opposed to me saying, well, here's a book I like, you try it. They may hate it, and now they're going to question the next book I give them. So I think having a really good foundation in what, you, what you've read can really help you get, get to um, giving the students – building those relationships and that, and that community in that classroom and giving the students um, more opportunities to want more from you. And, and leverage your resources. You know, if, if you may have a librarian in your school, that can be a big help. If you don't know what to find, go ask them, go to your public library, go to the ALA website and find people to help you. Librarians are such an amazing resource for teachers. I would definitely recommend doing that. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Librarians are, 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 I call yeah. them our pushers. Cause they can't. <laughs> like this, like like dance around with books. Like I can have in my classroom, but it's like there's this cool person down the hall who has like all the books. That if you just go ask them, they will gladly give it to you. Yeah, and I can't the the idea of that relationship. I think that's like the foundation of everything that we've all been saying. I mean, when I started teaching 11 years ago, middle aged white guy into a Title One school, thrown in the deep end what does this guy have to say to us that we're, we could be interested in? Oh, wait, he likes the flash. Oh, wait, he can talk about fast and the furious and. <laughs> no. And staying current, staying up with this stuff. He's back. Yeah. yeah. I talk to my internet provider. It's all right. It's it's part of it's part of the technology stuff. I mean, you know, we have had to remind myself these things are not human. I, can't I didn't want to say your, anything. Your internet might be so fast and furious that it's yeah. Heavy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I think we, again, thank you all so much. I'm going to open it up for questions. We already have a few. Um, 
And so attendees to you, instead of posting in the chat, if you would, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you let your uh, mouse hover, you will see um, a Q&A option there. But we'll start with one from, it looks like it's from Jeff, and it's directed to Matt. It says, Matt, do science students have an opportunity to create journals and posters based on experiments in your classes, and how does that look? Oh, wait, I see. Hang on. Yeah. Science students have an opportunity to create journals and posters based on experiments. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, great question. Um, how do they look? Right now, I've kind of, I've been starting to take more steps into having them journal with um, comics. Like I said, the annotated uh, formulas. Um, I really kind of am straddling the line right now as I learn what works best in science um, with infographics uh, versus straight up comics as, as the explanation. Um, but each year I take another step towards that because um, some of my infographics have from students that they've turned in have had characters go up in them, which is, is that, that way to do it. But I can have them explain a phenomenon usually, as I said, with an infographic um, where they kind of have to tell me a story about it step by step, which flows right into the comic format. Thank you. Uh, another question from Brandy. Uh, she asked, can you suggest any Chromebook apps for drawing um, for students who want to draw their own comics as opposed to pre-generated images? And then she said, or do you have them scan their work? Ronald, do you have any suggestions on that? So, okay, I'm kind of lame because I have kids use Keynote, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, I have them, you know, because we're a one-to-one -one, uh, iPad school. Mm -hmm. So rather than like going out and finding like some app that does that thing specifically, uh, I just made uh, Keynote templates with blank panels in it. And then my kids can just draw on those or they could draw and import those in the keynote. Um, and that was just pretty, just a simple, it, it looks crude at first, but like once kids, they, they're like, like any tool, uh, once kids understand how to master something, it's great. Um, there is a book making app that I'm losing my mind right now that we have in our district and I would have to, oh my God, is it called book, is it, is, could it really be called book creator? I think it is. Book creator is one. Um, it's a free-ish app. Uh, you can, it, kids can publish an e-book through it. They have a comic format. They can introduce uh, drawings. They can put audio, video in those books. Um, and then I think, you know, I know that this does have pre-drawn things, like Tracy said, but Make Believe Comics is a great place to start. And you could even have the kids use everything there except for the, um, the characters. If you ask any artist, uh, they will tell you that backgrounds are the worst things to draw. So if you just use something like a Make Believe Comics to like create just the background stuff and then let the kids draw in there, that would be great. And uh, probably pretty, at least a good step in the right path. Are there any other questions from attendees? few seconds. Um, I would uh, like to mention, um, although comics, as we have pointed out and, and demonstrated today, they are an incredible tool for engaging students. They are amazing um, tools in the classroom. They have educational benefits. However, unfortunately, um, like all books, um, they are still challenged and banned, and that's where CBLDF comes in. And I want to let you all, oh, well, we do have one more question, but I will finish up my spiel here on our resources. Um, I want to show you really quick, let me hit my share, where you can find our resources. Doom. And let me share this, but let me go to where I, right here. All right, so on our website, uh, under resources, if you click on library and educator tools, you will see all of these tools that we have. Let me close all this other stuff down because I think I'm probably showing you all of that too. Technology is not 
mm-hmm. something I'm very uh, good at, y'all. I'm doing, I'm doing my best. We'll get through it together. Um, anyway, so we have all of our all of our tools here. Uh, these are to help you incorporate um, comic book curriculum into your schools, into your libraries, um, to create programs, um, ha- including even everything from starting book clubs. We have things like this for that comic book clubs uh, to actually um, suggestions for how to defend comics. Uh, if you are presented with a challenge. So one more question, and it is one, but we will go ahead and and, um, answer uh, or or, uh, address this question. Any resources, are there any resources available for visually impaired students? And this is from Annette. Do y'all know of any? I would probably start with what Eric just brought up to our attention. Um, the the voice actors reading comments. I think that's dope. I, I want to go like watch some of those now. <laughs> and they have and they have adapted some. Like there is a uh, I believe. Well, I know there for sure is a lock and key like series, uh, uh, like a web book. So they they took that graphic novel and they've made it into um, an audible like web series. It's not web series, like audio series. And I think they created a Miss Marvel one too. Like if I'm not mistaken, I think there's a Miss Marvel audio book based on the graphic novel as well. I also want to say that um, I don't want to just veer towards, uh, you know, audio because I'm the assumption is that people are completely visually impaired. Right, right. Uh, so if, if you read something like on a comic reading app, like Comixology or even Kindle, you can zoom in on images. I had kids who were visually impaired who just needed things to be magnified. And I gave them access to a digital reader. So I think those can be invaluable too. Yeah, reading panel by panel where the whole panel, it's not just you're not looking at the whole page, but each panel fills up the entire screen. That mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. It's a different way to read a comic, but it definitely does zoom in on all of them. It's a really good way. And Tony Weaver, who is an attendee, and actually I know you, Tony. Hey, how are you? Hey, Tony. <laughs> I think uh, we all know Tony. Yeah, we all know Tony. Tony's great. Tony suggested um, getmedialit.com. Um, thank you for that. And it's comics and curriculum tools for middle school and high school. And they address uh, SEL and digital literacy, which is a great space. Um, nobody else is doing that in comics, so that's good. Well, thank you all. It is, we are now one, are two minutes over. Um, I will give you all, just since we've already two minutes over, we might as well just uh, do a little bit more. Uh, give you all a chance to promote your websites or, or, or any information you have that you would like uh, for folks to know speak it or type it in the in the chat bar so they can find you and find your stuff <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, oh, go ahead, Eric. no go ahead tracy it's okay no i have a website it's real easy tracyedmonds.com and i have a lot of free things on there if you go to the resources section there's a whole bunch of uh, free stuff you can download and use if you want to spend a tiny bit of money i do have a teachers pay teacher store um a lot of good uh things to use if you're just starting out um teaching comics to kids that's me. Yeah, I'm on the, the other comic book teacher dot com uh, blog occasionally twice a week. But now with this new job, I'm every Sunday I do a Sundays for teachers blog. And if it's a holiday weekend, I'll do it on Monday. So it's basically the day we go back to school. So whenever whatever I'm trying to think of teachers at home, like sad that they got to go back to work tomorrow, then they can read my blog for a little inspiration for the week. So every every Sunday night or Monday night, if we had Monday off, uh, visit the comic the other comic book teacher dot com to uh, check out my teacher blog. So who's the original comic book teacher? <laughs> that would be Rana Whitaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just faster than Eric. That's all that is. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I haven't been writing as much over there as I would like. Uh, I vowed to start writing more over there. Um, but if you want to follow me on Instagram, I write, I write a bit more over there at the comic book teacher um, that that's where I get to kind of follow all these cool people and see the the Disneylands and Disney worlds they go to. Um, but yeah, go, go to thecomicbookteacher.com or go to uh, the comic book teacher at Instagram. There's my D, there's my, there's my D23 Ursula right there. <laughs> so jealous, man. I didn't go to D23. I got that hot top or uh, box lunch. <laughs> Um, and as I've been saying, I, our website is boom, 
thescienceof.org. Is it live if I do this? It is, yes. Oh, cool. So yeah, um, I'm writing the articles on it. And actually, um, I, I did click that. Come on. There you go. Um, but the articles go into a pop culture topic right now. This one was about the an idea of a biological chimera um, that has been played with in X-Men a little bit. And uh, so we have articles kind of front facing that are interested. Hopefully we'll bring in some eyes um, and get people interested in science through pop culture. We also have a growing, well, right now it's not growing that much. Um, we have area on our website for a teacher community, a STEM teacher community that are nice. interested in using pop culture right now. I think it might be entirely populated by bots and probably some Russians, um, but we're going to get that straightened out and cleared up and start getting people in there talking about it. So um, you can get in touch with us any way you want to through the website. Um, and I have a Facebook feed that we run pop culture and science articles on anything that we can find for starting off class. Oh, and also I have a book coming out <laughs> October 1st. <laughs> Please get it. Yay. <laughs> Um, and also, panel, uh, not panelists, but attendees, uh, be looking in your uh, email boxes this next week. Um, Tracy and Eric both provided us with some um, little handouts, some curriculum things that can get you started um, to incorporate comics into your classroom. Again, thank you all for, uh, for, for being here with us. You are all beautiful people. I appreciate your time and your expertise. And this has been fun. So thank you for uh, an enjoyable Saturday. I hope Thanks you have a me. yeah, I hope you have a beautiful Thank day guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye everybody. <laughs>